Hey, how's it going on guys? I'm sort of dressed and that's because I'm going out today which is interesting because I rarely go out but today I'm going out and I'm going out because of something really important something special, something gets my heart so um, let's see how this goes Today guys, we have the Meiji in the building. <laughs> so, um, we are just basically chilling with the Meiji and, I don't know, talking, creating people talk. So, please, do you mind introducing yourself to the community, most of which already probably know you, but <laughs> for the sake of um, uh, Thank you so much for having me. Uh, long and short, the Meiji, my name is the Meiji, Ola the Meiji, and... The two eyes. Uh, he, no, that's just for Instagram. <laughs> Uh, I'm a Christian creative and that basically sums up, you know, what I do. I have this strong belief in my faith, which inspires me to be, you know, the kind of person I am and to express my creativity the way I do. Uh, but for work, I work as a designer and I'm an architect. And yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Interesting. You studied architecture? Yes, I did. And you why? Uh, no, you I doesn't, I think they do not offer architecture, I don't think so. They just start, that's why I probably didn't go to UI because I grew up in New but no. So, Wait, okay, okay. Yeah. so, so you know again? No, it was um, Bell University. Oh, Bell, interesting. Yeah. How folks went to Bell's? Oh, it's a very weird space. Very <laughs> weird. <laughs> you literally will know almost everybody. Yeah, I, I, I did play Bell's second school. Okay. In chess competitions. Oh. You should be the ass. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So, first of all, Where did you start doing all of this design? How did you get into the creative space? Uh, I don't think I got into the creative space. Uh, I, I, I've lived it all my life, right? Uh, early in my days, I think I remember very well, I was six years old and I can remember uh, my dad and I driving through um, Dubai and I saw clouds. I think that was like the first time I saw Kwaos. And I pointed at it and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And I was telling him that one day I'm going to build something like this. He just smiled. <laughs> and when I was 11, he reminded me of that. Just, you know, that, oh, I just want to be building. And then uh, all through school, secondary school, I was always that kid that everybody knew for all those, you know, spray, yeah, so you draw things, draw comics. It was really, really interesting, but it was just one of those things that everybody was doing. So I felt like it was a normal thing. Like every child had to draw comics, right? And it was, yeah, and it was just like a given. Everybody had to do that. And then it got to a point I realized that I actually did it better than every other person. And I found more joy in it because even when um, there was something that is like important, important, like reading in school, for example, I never used to read. <laughs> when it comes to drawing things, uh, you know, making sketches, uh, just... I'm tinkering basically. I can just pick up something and see that it's faulty and try to fix it. So it's been something that's been there right from time. I feel like it's in it in me. But then when I became really conscious about it and started working towards it was uh, when I entered uni, um, 2011. Uh, oh. Architecture exposed me to the world of design like really, really well because architecture is basically design, but they focus more on buildings. So at that particular space, I just wanted to understand more about design beyond buildings. And then that was where my search for design as a lifestyle started. And it's been just like a... Yeah, it's not linear, but it's exponential. So it's like, it wasn't smooth, like, oh, just 
it happened like gradually, gradually, gradually. So I'm here now and I feel like there's still a lot more to, to be done. Definitely. Definitely. So, so when did you first encounter Photoshop? Because that was like the, that was like the business. That's, yeah. yeah. It was 2011. So I was, you know the way we borrow our drives to copy movies? Yeah. For me, I don't copy movies. Copy <laughs> I copy apps. Or, yeah, exactly. And at the time, YouTube was in a space where Nigerians really maximized. So uh, the people that I saw doing this design thing, uh, Roberto Blake and a couple of other persons, but they're not Nigerian. So mm. I didn't really have that thing that helped me understand design from this part of the country. So encountering Photoshop for the very first time, I opened it and it was just a blank canvas. Like, very scary. Yeah. What and then Pinterest was existing then. So I went on Pinterest and I was seeing designs that people have done. And I'm wondering, like, how did you produce this from this empty space? So I was very intrigued. And I just started practicing. Uh, so I would download designs on Pinterest and reproduce and try to just make it better or add my own touch to it. Uh, my first set of designs were terrible. But then, yeah, but well, over time, uh, based on practice, and anytime I watch a tutorial, one of the ways I know that I know this thing really well is when I really have to go back to the tutorial again to do it. So once I learned something, uh, that was where I started operating on this uh, thing that, I think, was it Thomas Edison that talked about it, that 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. You learn the very basic and then you practice the rest. And that was really, really insightful for me. So after learning that, it was just uh, a, a really smooth move. Learn something and then practice it so you don't have to go back to the person who taught you. So yeah, Photoshop was like the starting point. <laughs> and then <laughs> you just grew into this. But then before Photoshop, there's been a lot of other, other app and software. So mm -hmm. SketchUp, like for architecture anyway. Mm -hmm. So the idea I had from those ones is basically the same um, there. You find the, the way Windows used to be, right? You find everything there, the toolbars, everything. So it was very easy to just transition to a design-based software, just not just for buildings or architecture, and it was really interesting. That, that was amazing for you. Yeah. I always went to Photoshop <laughs> from sketchpads to Photoshop. Back then, me and my brother we had like several sketchpads. Just so draw drawing, things. Um, we made like several comics. Others we even print them, you know, make our comics like Super Striker. <laughs> I did that too. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah. Well, nice. Do you, do you dabble in other apps like Illustrator, um, InDesign, Cinema 4D? You know, arch architects use, so that's an excellent idea. They use AutoCAD. Yeah, no, uh, if you everybody uses AutoCAD, AutoCAD as long as you're in the construction or engineering development space. engineering space. So, yeah, uh, a lot of applications actually. There's AutoCAD, there's Revit, there's um, Cinema Revit. 4D, yeah, there's. Um, there's Maya, there's, uh, I, I got really invested in Blender, you know, building different characters and stuff. Build characters? Yeah. Okay, so building characters is just a way to just like bring about some ideas in your head. For example, all those cartoons you see, right, most of them use Blender or Maya. Just a way to just build up characters, animate them to move. You can do voiceovers and do the mouths. So all those things, well, learning them then it was just for fun. Not knowing that there's a whole, whole world out there that yeah. is really, really, really expensive, that getting into it will just be a breakthrough for you. But I didn't see myself going that path. So I'm like, that's where I see myself. VFX, <laughs> motion, 3D, that, that's. Yeah, that's it's that. actually really, really interesting because uh, it's like bringing things in your head to life. And I feel like when you don't explore enough, you just think what you know is everything. Yeah. So. That's, that's amazing. To think you were learning that for four now, I'm racking my head every time to learn to my 4D. Like, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. Yeah, but, but you know, school made it seem as though it's a necessary thing. Yeah. But then, if you take away that part of, oh, school is mandating you to do yeah. this thing, right? It's more to yeah, explore. Like, I was building, um, like, I started with building, uh, like, uh, construction bricks in Blender. Just yeah. find a way to just mesh things together. And then it gradually grew into stick figures, and then it became um, trying to find a way to uh, illustrate myself, you know. So, but <laughs> I messed it up. <laughs> like the nose was too big. A lot of things just went wrong. But then I was I was able to achieve something. And then after a while, I started just trying to craft, craft out caricatures and things just to, like look interesting. Not exactly like trying to reproduce, you know, someone in yeah. And I think. 
if you want to learn something, you don't go through the, um, I'm trying to just explore alone route. Like, uh, there was something the school system taught me, and I feel like we all can apply to our life. If you think about this, the school sort of makes you feel like, if you don't do this thing, you're not going to advance or, you know, yeah. And if you see it that way, that means you have to nail it now and move. Because if you skip a stage, probably you skip, you know, from stage four and then you jump to stage seven. When you get to stage 10, it's possible that something in stage 10 will demand knowledge from stage four. So let it like let that diligence just follow you all the way. When I realize that, I'm like, ah, I can't keep trying to, you know, follow shortcuts. Just do it the way it's supposed to be done. And even if you don't get the result you desire, it's not a lost knowledge. It's always come back to you. Yeah. You're always, you're always to see it. Yeah, but well, I don't sort of see them as failure. It's just experiences. <laughs> yeah, experiences. I mean, I feel like we could do this for like twenty minutes. Now, exactly. Twenty minutes is just an hour long. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, um, so, h- how has life as a creative generally been? It's very in Nigeria creative world. It's I mean, so what different mm-hmm. over there from the way they charge to um, work procedures to yeah. payments to the actual interactions. Yes. Yeah. Nigerian people are always Nigerian people. And resources. <laughs> Let's not skip <laughs> exactly. that part of resources. So, how's it been for you? Okay. So, uh, I'll just tell the story. I, I like I like telling stories. Please, so, I took, a, I took a ethos from architecture just for a couple of years, just to explore more beyond buildings. And then in 2018, I got invested really in storytelling and just being able to tell stories that people can resonate with, share my experiences as a designer, as a creative. And when I you know, wanted to start, I realized that the barrier of entry was ridiculously expensive. Like in my head, I felt like I had to get cameras, I had to get microphones and a lot of other things. And I started saving up. And believe me, I saved up for six months. Throughout 2018, I was saving. I was doing NYC then. And as I was saving, the money wasn't just getting, it wasn't complete. And then, December 20, 20, 2018, um, there was the family emergency kind of a thing, and then the money had to go into it. And now I'm back to ground zero. And I'm asking myself, now that I don't have anything to use to sort of start this thing, I procrastinated long enough. So at the time, I had a LG V20 phone, and it was pretty good with video. So I just brought it out one morning, and I'm like, by fire by force, I must make videos. And I shot the very first video, it was terrible. Uh, I, I was I was I, I was stuttering all through the video. Like the way I'm feeling like this, it was terrible. Like when I watched the video again, I was just like, who is this guy? But then um, through practice, right, trying it over and over again, uh, I realized I actually didn't need it. I, I didn't need a camera. I already had one in my pocket. And then luckily for me, I worked with a music studio for their rebrand. And when I was done with the project, the man said. He knows I'm expensive. How much? It wasn't really much, but he said he knows I'm expensive, but he doesn't really have the funds to pay me. So he said, Do I mind getting paid in equipment? Yes. And he gave me my first microphone. And that was. <laughs> so that was how I got my first microphone. And that was what I used to start my podcast and my videos. It was a boom mic. I used the boom mic for podcast purposes and also for YouTube videos. That was, that was very good. Yeah, it was. And I, I, still, I still have it in my house. It was just very, very amazing. I'm like, okay. Now that I have this, <laughs> I still use it. Now that I have this, um, it's just a good space for me to just keep going. So the challenges are the tools you think you need are not the things you actually need. The ones you have in your, you know, in hand currently, start with those. Right now, I shoot the cameras. People say my videos are clear. I started with smartphones, where I, what actually inspired this gray t-shirt was because when I'm shooting on a black t-shirt, there's grain. So the gray sort of makes, there's already grain on the gray t-shirt if you look at it. <laughs> so that was how the gray t-shirt started, although I wear t-shirts a lot, but I just stuck with gray. That, that, that was definitely good Yeah, <laughs> I'm telling you. So I did have to start, and my, my walls were white. So I did have to start, you know, re-editing and doing all sort of too many things. Just by this, it became really good. And I kept with that. The the yeah. Uh, I wrote, our, our first video was called Creative. You know? I think you I, it was a UI hotel. Okay. The lapel mic while I was like, I was dropping this. <laughs> and then we used this really small tripod. Okay. And then I think my old phone. Because also it looks very. Uh, we'll probably put that out for people to see, but then it was terrible. Yeah, but looking at it now, 
there's 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 progress. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. So speaking of speaking of um creating content or starting starting creating content, I checked your YouTube channel and I saw you be making videos as far back as 2019. Yeah. Somewhere in my head decided with the pandemic because that's when you started with the show. No. <laughs> Allow me rest. And I check your pain. I'm like, oh, nice stuff. Let's meet up there and so I'm like, yeah, I can't do it too now. Scott creators can't do it too. But well, you know, it feels more new the content every time. So how how did you start? Okay. What, what inspired it? And then I noticed you have more of a following on Instagram than on YouTube. Yeah. So I wonder what the dynamics are because I know it can be very tricky. Mm, so I started in 2019 actively. That was when. So what actually opened up the whole thing was I was in these daily blogs okay. where I would share what I worked on today and just like a, it's, it's like it's like a time lapse of me working. So uh, do the time lapse of me working, take a break, you know, grab tea or something, go back to work. So I recorded all those and I was putting it out in 60 seconds. And people started seeing, oh, they made you doing daily vlogs. And then a lot of people just started doing it. You were ahead of your time. like reels now. Yeah, that was, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the sad part is I lost all those files. <laughs> but I didn't mind. Because wow. I, 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 I edited them on, on InShot on my phone. Okay. So I didn't back up. But I, I didn't really feel bad because, yeah, they were just expressions I was just going through. So I understood short form content right from them. Because no, it was no, no, engaging. No. Like imagine someone just seeing you, uh, you know, just living your life in like 60 seconds. And it was very interesting. I'll probably go out, I'll document the whole thing. So it was like, I didn't, I didn't understand blogging. So I'm like, this is stress. Now I sit down and watch a seven, like 60, like almost five, 10, 20 minutes video about someone just talking about their day. So I'm like, I'm going to make it short and put it out there. So time lapse, as uh, times I need to just talk about something, I just talk, I do voiceovers. And it was really interesting. So I did that for about six months while also doing a podcast. So the podcast started from, um, I usually like, whenever I meet people for the very first time and there are people like I sort of enjoy whatever conversation it is, uh, I always record the conversation on voice notes. So when I get back home, I just listen to it again, just to learn. Like I learned a lot from people, not necessarily um, books, I started reading books eventually, but from people, like just conversations. Yeah. And I realized that all those conversations I was having, they were really, really rich. And it just dawned on me, why am I being selfish with this knowledge? So I said, let me start sharing with people. But then I couldn't be sharing the crude. Um, so that was where the podcast started from. But so then, said podcast in 2019, February. Mm -hmm. But before the podcast started, I listened to a podcast by Matt Devella in 2018. The episode was recorded two years before. And two years after, it was helping me. And I'm wondering, this is evergreen content. I can create something like this too. So when I was trying to start, I would just to do audio only, but I'm like, there's video all over the place. So just do video as well. And that was where, yeah, the video just came about. And it sort of became a new dynamic for the whole podcasting for me. And people started seeing that and it just grew. Now with the YouTube, Instagram thing, um, I didn't really take it like, it's a big deal, right? Um, YouTube was just, let me just put out my content there. Instagram, the same thing. Uh, I didn't know I was going to go viral or anything. Because I did podcasts and YouTube videos 2019, 2020. Nothing changed. Like my same 600 followers increased about, you know, 1,200 after one year. Everything was still cool. But then, uh, in November 2019, I made a particular piece of content about free resources that every creative should, you know, have. And we should, we should write that down. the yeah. video went viral. Like, no, the, the carousel went viral. It was a carousel. Right? Yeah, it was a carousel. And then more than 60 Instagram design blogs, we shared it. And I calculated the analytics. It was over like 2 million in reach. Ooh. But then on my own page, only 2,000 people stayed. Do you understand? So what happened? They just came because they saw that kind of content. It was a spontaneous thing. I was in a design class. And after the class, I said like, wait, I learned about these resources. Let me share it with other persons. So that's not the kind of content I create normally. But because it was different, it went viral. People were expecting to see more of that, but they didn't. But then they saw that I've been making other kind of videos and some of them stayed. Because if you imagine, if say, if like 500,000 people, you know, reach up a, a, a post, but then only 2,000 stay, it means that those 2,000 are actually your loyal people. Yeah. So I started creating more for them than the crowd. 
But then the spike in numbers happened in 2021 because of reels. I made a dancing reel for the very first time. And people had never seen that before. And it became a thing. And people wanted to keep seeing more of that, but that is not the entirety of the Meiji. So it got to a point that, you know, it had to stop. It's a phase thing. My content, they develop based on how I'm evolving as well. So I don't stay fixed to a particular thing. I just try and evolve as time goes by. So my YouTube is for people who value, like, figuring life out, real stuff. Instagram is for, you know, cruise. Right. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. There's the disparity in the moment. Exactly. Uh, that's interesting. So, what can you point to any video in particular that um, really shot up the numbers? Okay, um, so it was um, um, me trying to go out on a Friday night, and then as I was trying to get ready, before I knew it, uh, there was laundry. Um, I need to sleep because I'm fatigued all week, and then you know my bank account says no. <laughs> <laughs> so the video just blew up on TikTok. It did about I think 3.7 million. Whoa. On Instagram, it did about 4.5 million. On YouTube, it did about 20k. Wow. So it was just, and then there were more content like that. So yeah, so it was relatable. It was direct. It was just real life experiences. Sure. Yeah. So aside from those, is there, are there any other things that sort of helped you hack the whole? Oh yeah. Uh, so speaking of retention too, because one thing for one video to do, another thing to keep people. Yeah, that pace. Yeah. So 2020 during lockdown, I did 100 days of Premiere Pro. I was learning how to use Premiere Pro, newly. I was using it okay, but it wasn't all that good. So you were learning Premiere Pro. What were you doing to edit your video before? Before I was using InShot and Filmora screen on laptop. But then I just went full into Premiere Pro because I was doing more interviews to press like three different cameras. So I can't be cutting those. Exactly. So Premiere Pro just exposed me to the whole idea of, okay, you can actually do something that is different, but at the same time, let it be engaging. So the 100 days of Premiere Pro, I was doing short form videos, 60 seconds, 10 seconds, 5 seconds, whatever it is I'm just inspired to do. And I was sharing that those on TikTok. So I gave myself this thing that like an accountability system where if 7 p.m. reaches on a particular day and I don't upload a video, the next day I was upload two videos. So the fear of not wanting to be editing too many videos just made me to stick with the 100 days. And by the end of 100 days, I understood something about short form content. You don't have to talk. You don't have to do demonstrations. You don't have to do excessive things. Just have a very clear and cut caption. People just read it. They don't even need to hear you speak. But your expressions and then the choice of sound can actually make things different. And I started doing more of that. Now, every time I learned during lockdown, I, I was doing it little by little, but nothing really changed until I started doing it every day on Instagram. And from August 2019, 2021, till uh, February this year, I uploaded a video every day. Wow. A, a reel every day on Instagram. That was, that was every single day. So, uh, just going all through that, that was what actually made my number of posts increase because every day I probably share like two to three different posts. And the accumulation actually brings about more numbers. Because I've always explained this idea that, imagine if for every single post you create, you get 10 followers. By the time you create a thousand posts, how many followers do you have? But then do you know that some posts will do like 500 followers, some posts will do 20, some posts will do nothing. But, and if you check, a lot of these pages on Instagram who have above 10k followers, you see the number of posts will be above 500. Except, you know, uh, models. <laughs> no shades to anybody. But yeah, so that's just the way it is. So if you're a creator, the more you put out, the more people see the things you do, the more numbers you get. So it's about just sticking with that thing and exploring as much as you can. Like I use all the different things Instagram provides, live sessions, um, reels, carousels, single posts, everything. Because I know that if they're making it available, then explore. And that's just where I saw it then. So um, going viral wasn't really the target for me because I didn't even know. Like it was a dancing video. I just put it out there and I went to bed. For the first time ever, my, as in my phone was hot, and I saw that 100 on that notification thing for the very first, I was like, whoa, 100 followers in one day. And then it kept happening like that. So, that's, that's, that's good. That's, so, quick question How are you able to discipline yourself to post something every single day? I mean, I'm usually there, like posting, <laughs> <laughs> posting twice a week. So, how are you able to, how, first of all, how are you able to? 
discipline yourself and then you do have like a of the process okay and you know the whole time management project management thing because i mean you're a designer as well yeah and occasionally well i don't know how your architecture thing works but then an architect as well yeah so how how have you been able to manage the consistency the discipline and all that with your processes in general uh i would add, i would accredit a lot of these things to architecture because you it's have architecture. <laughs> you have a three months project and you know, we won't start until like the last month. And even the last month, you're just perusing the entire space and then start the last week and then use the last four days to finish the project. I did that for four years and then two extra years for masters. And I was like, God, I can't keep living my life like this because I understood that procrastination, when it is time bound, is good. But then now that it is real life, that there is no direction. Like, it's just a continuous life. How do you not keep procrastinating? You say, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. So you don't do it. So, uh, I stumbled into a phase of my life that I'm not so excited to talk about, but then I became a productivity junkie where I must achieve something in a day. If I don't, I feel like I'm useless. <laughs> and as much as that seems like a not so great thing, it helps me. So now, I'm excited working with time blocks. And then instead of working with goals or to-do lists, I start working with systems where I batch my activities based on time and I'm accountable to that. So say I wake up in the morning, say 7 a.m. Between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m., the first hour of my waking up period, because I, I don't know, sometimes I wake up 8, 9, 10, 11 sometimes. But then, because if you're sleeping 6 a.m., you can't wake up 7 a.m., <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So um, whatever, the first hour of waking up goes into my, you know, personal time, devotion, and then the next hour is for well-being, you know, get something to eat, exercise, or whatever. I cycle too. And then after that, uh, the next four hours is for client work, which is what pays my bills. Because if I don't do that, <laughs> Instagram doesn't pay me, YouTube doesn't pay me. So what is you funding the... No. Because oh. I don't have 4,000... Yeah, I don't have that. I actually got lazy at some point. But then... Um, so... What pays the bills, I focus on that for the first four hours. And then... There's a one hour in between where I do content creation and just fleshing out ideas. And once I'm done with that, I go back to client work again. And then after that, I do like consultations, talk to people, just, you know, find a way to just express myself. And then uh, I'm basically a free man for the rest of the day. Now during that free period, I'm creating content, documenting things. I'm basically just trying to just express myself more than the work, work, work I have to do. And that happens every day, except Saturday and Sunday. So if that happens every day, then that means uh, things shouldn't be, you know, be, be pushed to later. And before I go to bed every night, I do this thing called brain dump, where I'm probably just dumping all the ideas in my head onto a uh, whiteboard. And when I wake up in the morning and I'm looking at the whiteboard, it just hits me. Oh, I can actually share this as a content on Instagram. And entering Canva, put one or two things together, it becomes, you know, so content. You use Canva too. Yeah. <laughs> That's for all those tweets, all those Great examples. Because yeah. once I have something in my head and it's been compress into something simple, it just goes out. But then for the videos, um, I write a lot. So as I'm writing these ideas, I'm breaking them down into digestible content. As I'm doing that, the idea is already there. All I need to do now is sit down and make the video. And making the video shouldn't take long because I've practiced it for all lockdown to be able to not do it faster and more effectively. So, so yeah, so uh, I write, which is Google Keep. A lot of those things are inside Google Keep. Like ideas for the next say three months, I Google Keep. I could just peruse, I just scroll through, pick one, and then create. And then I repurpose my content a lot. But people people don't understand because the magic wears the same T-shirt, so you won't know the same video has been used like seven times. I'm into that. I'm into that. I'm into that. I'm into that. <laughs> exactly. But then what the, what what is different is that the sound is different, the message is different, the expressions are different, but it's still the same outfit. I need that, like, so, I see what I need. Yeah, because if you have to think about it, creating content every day is stressful. Yeah. So just I just developed a system that allows me. So there might be days where I have enough time and I just record like 10 scenes without any message. But then when the yeah. message is coming, okay, scroll, 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 this one fits in. So I just pick it. And, nice. So, and then um, between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m., that's when I edit videos for Instagram. So. I can edit like seven videos, which means that I'm done for the week and I'm just posting. But then when I need to be spontaneous, you know, it doesn't like take too long because 
I've practiced it a while. So I'm used to it now. That's awesome. That's what my daughter here. <laughs> my coming to watch. Yeah. So how how do you say the content creation as well has helped your creative career as well? Like what's the what's the benefits mm. you know, from your own perspective? So I think content creation helps you to establish a personal brand better because now you are exp you are sharing based on what you know and who you are. So and I know for one that a personal brand helps you to lead, helps you to win and helps you to earn. So once you're leading in a space, people know you, there's so-called influence, if it doesn't get to your head anyway. <laughs> and then, um, good job. <laughs> and then um, it helps you win because now people see you and they're like, oh, this guy does this, contact him. Yeah. And then that translates to you earning, so. Amazing, yeah. amazing. So is, is it measurable for you, the number of clients you get from your, just the influence as well? Oh. Uh, the influence just gives you visibility. Okay. Uh, you can't really track it. Basically. No, because tracking it would mean that you have to you have to keep account of every single. And trust me, hundred DMs daily is <laughs> not a piece of cake. So just know how to manage your own time. But then what's important is, as much as it's this online world, build something traditionally that stands. Like most of my clients come from referrals and recommendations. The few that come from you know online activities is from pixels not even instagram because instagram everyone wants to be influencer uh, and i'm not an influencer so if you come with me and say help us promote this product if i don't use a product i can't talk about it so that's just the way it is so it's just a bubble that i feel like when you can burst it early build something that stands you know outside the online space let that fund your lifestyle online because if you're trying to use the online life to fund everything. I'm sorry, <laughs> you, you'll be heartbroken. Because think about it, if the reason why you're starting a YouTube channel is to get monetized and start making money. We have billions of people oh, who are sorry. doing that and they're not making anything. Like actively on a daily basis, there are over 2 billion views on YouTube every day. Like so just imagine that. We're in Nigeria. It's bound to happen. <laughs> so, if it doesn't happen, then you should question a couple of things. But yeah. Oh, amazing. I think, how, how many minutes have we done? Not like 20 minutes. 31 minutes. Whoa. All right. All right. Okay, so that's, that's one last thing. Okay. Um, what, what would you like to tell the people in the creative space, on our community, um, IG, well, everywhere we are on this space? What, what would you like to tell creative people worldwide? Yeah. Um, where should I look at? You should look at here, right? Oh, here. All right, so as I said uh, at the beginning of the video, right, on my way here, I made like a short message. Uh, it's very important to know that uh, no one else owns your creative life. It's yours. But then it is not about you, but it is for you. And what I mean by that is this. The message you have to share, you're sharing it to people, not necessarily, um, you know, keeping it to yourself. Your Instagram is not for you. It's for the people who are viewing it. So don't be too uh, self-aware, right? But at the same time, understand who you are, the message you have to share, and leave these things with your life. Because if nobody can see the relationship between what you do and who you are, then what is the point? So in essence, build a personal brand that is strong and has your values in it. Don't try to copy someone else. And this is a lifestyle that I feel like uh, when you practice it over and over again, in diligence, you see results, you'll be rewarded. But don't think the world will come immediately. So over time, over time. <laughs> the, the dog just confronted. <laughs> so yes, that's the dog listened. You also should listen. I mean, well, that, that, that's actually very deep. That's yeah. Actually very deep. I, I love how you always you know, put out there. Um, you create some creative, creative, creative. We could talk for one hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you very much for for joining us. Thank you for you know. What's your I'm gonna say honoring our our, our people today. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it was great. I'm glad I was here. Yeah, so. so please, you guys should follow the media on Instagram, on YouTube. He has amazing content. And probably has better content yeah, on definitely. YouTube than on Instagram. But then, of course, Instagram or no. Um, and then your podcast on... Uh, so there's the Simple Creative. Okay. Uh, that's, so it's actually loaded. Interviews with uh, people that can help you sort of lead your life you want to live. Uh, bad interviews with uh, Salem King. Um, Fisayo Fosudo, and a lot like very 
people who have no not, not even big like people who have Inside. strong message yeah. like because if you're trying to be a creator and have the cue you need to get started you know listen to that episode with salem king if you're trying to understand you know master something listen to the one with kisayo if you're trying to understand storytelling there's one with alma and a lot more i will just open your mind to see that look there is more to what i have to do than just sitting down and thinking uh instagram is everything right um the story you have to tell is valid tell it with your life i think that's it Definitely need to check your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> if you guys didn't face that, I'm going to check. Yeah. Well, Amazing. So, thank you guys once again. See you next time. Awesome. Yeah. So, you can keep going for BTS business. <laughs> okay. Wow. wow. Now I know There's I talk one... a lot. I thought I don't talk at all. <laughs> There's one minute. Wow. Amazing. It was great. I'm, I'm so glad I did.